Good evening and welcome everyone. This event is being recorded. Buenas tardes y bienvenidos. Este evento está siendo grabado. Please note that you can continue with no video or audio. Por favor, tenga en cuenta que puede continuar sin video y sin audio. This meeting will have live interpretation between English and Spanish. Esta reunión tendrá interpretación en directo entre el inglés y el español. Antes de comenzar, si alguien necesita servicios de interpretación, por favor, haga clic en el icono del globo que aparece abajo. Si tiene dificultades técnicas, por favor, comparta esa información en el chat. Thank you all for joining us tonight. I am very excited to have our panelists here with us to take part in our discussion regarding equity and education. Thank you to those of you who submitted questions for our panelists. And we may not be able to get to all of those questions, but this conversation will continue beyond tonight's discussion. Um, if you have a question, please uh, enter it into the Q&A and we'll answer your question by email. I want to share a quick quote by Jimmy Santiago Baca, who is an award-winning Chicano poet and writer. He served time in a maximum security prison and his life changed when he learned to read. He stated, when you can't read, you have no idea how the world works. You assume so much because you're living in this isolation of illiteracy. And there are many children here in California living in this isolation of illiteracy. And this should alarm everyone. So thank you for being here tonight. And I wanna go ahead and introduce our panelists. First, Tanya Murray. She's a software engineer turned dyslexia advocate and creator of the website Dyslexia First 100 Days. Her son received dyslexia intervention because of her advocacy. She is pursuing a master's degree in the learning design and technology program at Stanford University so that she can develop applications that meet the needs of both teachers and neurodiverse students. We also have John Rodriguez, who is the executive director of Think Lexic, and he's also the author of High School Dropout to Harvard and a professional ice sculptor. He dropped out of high school at 16, but eventually ended up at Harvard and graduated from Berkeley. His work focuses on dyslexia advocacy and challenging everyone to rethink the nature of intelligence. We also have Dr. Keon Anderson. He is the author of several books, including Prosper and They Say We Don't, which is inspired by his experiences and personal struggle with dyslexia. His work focuses on helping underserved populations through nonprofit work, research, and mentorship. Dr. Anderson aims to help students with disabilities in fighting stigma and serve as a model for student success. We also have Kent Mendoza. He was born in Mexico and came to the US at the age of six. As a youth, he was exposed to gangs, drugs, and the school to prison pipeline. He joined a gang at 14 and was incarcerated at 15. After his release from the Department of Juvenile Justice, he began his journey supporting current and formerly incarcerated individuals through his involvement with the Anti-Recidivism Coalition. So welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here. And I wanna jump right in to these wonderful questions we have. So I'm gonna start uh, with the first question and, we'll, and then I'll have Dr. Anderson, you answer first and we'll move on to Mr. Rodriguez, Mr. Mendoza, and then to Ms. Murray. Why? Why did you feel it was important for you to be part of today's panel discussion? And uh, Mr. And Dr. Anderson, go ahead and uh, begin. Thank you. Um, I do sometimes talk a little fast. So if you need me to slow down, just cue me and signal and let me know. Um, so my education experience, I think, well, when I was experiencing it, I thought it was unique. I thought that I was one of a very inclusive crowd who struggled to learn how to read and write. Um, and I would go home after school and I would complain to my mom like, this just isn't making any sense. And she was sort of reassured by my teachers in early education that one day I was gonna get it. So I thought that one day I would wake up and I would be able to read and write and I would be able to function like other students. Unfortunately, that didn't happen. Um, I made it all the way to the ninth grade reading at about a second to third grade reading level. And I met a teacher named Miss O who really set me down and sort of taught me the fundamentals of reading and writing and decoding so that I could begin to move forward from that point. Um, within a matter of that year that I spent with Miss Obiago, 
I went from reading at a second to third grade reading level to actually being able to um, read at a great level pace. So that was like phenomenal growth within a year span. Within that next year, I was taking APs and honor courses. Um, I graduated high school, which I didn't think was gonna be possible when I first started. I went directly to a four year university after doing concurrent enrollment in high school. Um, I went and got a master's degree. I got a doctorate degree and I've now published 15 books which are all things that I didn't think would be possible um, if you had asked me two decades ago. Um, so I think it's sort of important because I think that my experience serves the notion that if supported correctly, um, students with differing ability can accomplish anything. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Dr. Anderson. Uh, John Rodriguez, tell us about why you're here today. Uh, well, I, the sense of community for you know, dyslexics or people with you know, learning struggles is uh, why I'm here. And I had similar struggles. You know, I kind of failed my way through uh, uh, primary school and middle school and high school. I eventually dropped out. But like, Ms. like Dr. Anderson said, once you learn how you learn, the sky's the limit. There is nothing that you can't do. And then I think very important is for people in the dyslexic community, you know, if they want, if their kid is interested in, in everything from making movies to, you know, technology, uh, to starting businesses, that there's somebody in the community that can help them. So my thing is, I want kids, you know, at a young age to, you know, know they learn dif differently, get what they, the resources they need. And then like, you know, so many of us say here, the sky's the limit. And then just I want to be a mentor to as many kids as possible to get them to live, you know, just a happy, fulfilling life and then pursue their, their interests. So. Thank you for that. All right, Mr. Mendoza, can you share with us why you're part of this panel discussion tonight? Yes, thank you. And I'm pretty hot over here. I thought I was going to be in a quarter area, but I got the sun right behind me, hitting me. But, um, so excuse the hotness. Uh, so yeah, I came, I mean, for me, you know, I came to this country when I was six years of age. You know, my mom wanted to bring me to this country to pursue higher education and a better future and basically reach the American dream that we all want to reach as young people coming from different countries. Uh, when I came to this country, unfortunately, I was residing in a community where there was a high level of presence of gangs, violence, and drugs. Uh, so I was immediately thrown into, into an education system without not knowing how to read or write in English. So, um, you know, my experience in elementary, that's where everything started because uh, because of that fact that I had just come from another country, the school and the, uh, the teachers, the faculty didn't understand how to uh, really properly serve me as an ESL student, as a non-English speaker. So my journey started at a young age uh, because my mom didn't know how to speak or write in, in, in English. So that meant that whenever, whenever I was given homework, assignments, and to do and to come back to school having these things done, I didn't have nobody really guiding me in none of these assignments and processes. So what happened out of that, uh, I would be excluded from participating in, in school field trips. I would be excluded from you know, being treated equal, uh, fairly and, equity, equi equ and, and equally like every other student in the classrooms. And ultimately, that started affecting my, my way of value in myself. I felt like an outcast. I felt like uh, I didn't belong, you know, and that really affected with my, my self-esteem, my, my, with myself. And ultimately, that led to me eventually at a young age, at the age of 15, being incarcerated because I was never given proper education at a young age. So I think that that's why I'm here talking about this here today, because it, uh, uh, it really contributed to a lot of my factors that ultimately led me into the juvenile justice system at a young age. Uh, and the system didn't know how to adapt its education and its curriculum to me, to my specific needs as an ESL student. And that's why I'm here today. Thank you for sharing that. All right, Ms. Murray, can you share with us why you're here today? I'm here today because uh, my son was identified with dyslexia uh, in second grade, and we were able to get him the help he needed to learn to read. Um, and to the point where uh, by fifth grade, he was reading a grade level and by seventh grade, he was in honors English. And I look around and I see all the other kids that are not getting help. And I think we need to take what it, do what it takes to make sure that every kid who needs help gets the help they need. 
And I'm just interested in, in reaching out to parents to, sh to share what I learned along the way mm -hmm. and maybe to try and help um, other kids get what they need. Thank you so much for sharing that. And we're gonna go on to our next, and it sounds like we have a lot of the sim, uh, similar stories um, at, at, its, at their core, right? There's, there's just not the support that students are, are um, that they need in school. So tell us, uh, Dr. Anderson, about what are some of the common misconceptions, uh, implicit biases that people had about you as a student? Um, sorry. I, Mr. If Mendoza, any. he was sharing his story and it, it really just rang in my mind. Um, this notion of punishing students who learn differently. Um, I don't think that before I made it to high school and I met Miss O that it was affirmed that my process could be different. Um, so there's sort of this notion of this perfect learner. And I would argue that even students who don't have differing abilities are not perfect learners. Um, so sort of coming in under this notion that everybody has to do it the exact same way or that you can just do it in this monolithic approach um, doesn't work. Some of the biases or misnomers that I got or messages that I received were really centered around my lack of intelligence. So um, there were people who were like, oh, you're disabled. So we'll relegate you and we'll put you over here in this classroom because you could never grasp this information even if you wanted to. And in knowing sort of a technical definition of like a student with a disability, it literally is that I just need additional support to be able to do the same work. Um, and then sort of this notion of fairness. I was actually working with a family earlier today um, when we were debriefing and sort of one of the teachers is talking about the notion of, well, I can't do this for this student if I can't do it for all of my other students. And it's like, have you heard of the Americans with Disabilities Act? because you have to be able to make reasonable accommodations. And there's sort of this notion that it's unfair for students to receive what's necessary for them to have an even shake. So um, I think at the root of it, it's equity. Um, other things that I sort of have here is um, this sort of this, this fear centered around um, needing to conform was a lot of like the messaging that I felt like that I received as I was going through the process. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, really trying to adapt to our students and and meeting them where they where they are. Right, um, Mr. Rodriguez, tell us about uh, some of the common miscon misconceptions, implicit biases that you experienced during your uh, educational years. Uh, well, I mean, in, the worst thing was, you know, in kindergarten you learn. Uh, you do well if you're dyslexic because you're working in groups and you're interactive, tactile. But in, in, in first grade, uh, because I learned differently and they were, uh, I guess, teaching me the way I learned that I was basically labeled as stupid or less than. And what I think is heartbreaking, you know, as a six-year-old to be labeled less than just takes, you know, your heart just drops and that whole you know it wasn't until years later that it gets filled and then the time when i was in school you know my parents didn't know any better so they echoed the same thing so that was heartbreaking so uh what i'm very hopeful for now is that uh just getting out the information that you know being dyslexic having a different a learning disability is just a different way of learning and then just highlighting the you know unique talents. I think the thing that turned things around for me is you want to, you know, kids need to find something that they're good at, that they can feel good about that. And then it'll change their, uh, I guess, their whole state of being. So that's kind of like the most significant thing, but um, getting out information about the just great talents that people with dyslexia have is, is uh, very important. There is just and it's, there's a lot of work to do. I mean, I, we've been, I think a lot of us have been doing this for years. There's still more to do, so. Right, so like that focus on the strengths that yes. our students have, as opposed to just having this deficit oriented perspective of our students, right? Um, Mr. Mendoza, can you talk about some of the misconceptions, some of the implicit biases that you experienced when you were in school? Yeah. I think for me was, uh, like I mentioned earlier, and kind of like what Dr. Anderson had mentioned, uh, for me was mostly, you know, because 
no I was an ESL English student. No, I was in a, an elementary setup in a setting where everything that was happening, I really didn't understand what was going on. I didn't know the material. I didn't understand none of it. Uh, so I guess you know, when I would come to class with no homework done or with assignments halfway done and just showing up that way, uh, the educators, you know, they they thought that I, I didn't I didn't want my education. Like I wasn't trying to get my education. It made it seem like I was a troubled kid that was just not doing it because I wasn't trying to get my education, but not them understanding that I just didn't know how to read. I didn't know how to ask for help. And if I did wanted to ask for help, I didn't know where to do it. Obviously I couldn't do it with my mom because my mom was working, doing what she needed to do to put money in the table. But at the same time, she doesn't even know how to read, spend uh, English or write in English or uh, doesn't understand the education system herself. So the misconception that I received was that I was constantly just criminalized for, not criminalized, but labeled a troubled kid at a young age simply because I didn't know how to read English. And so much that I often felt embarrassed and ashamed to be in classroom because I was so scared to be picked on to read uh, because there was a popcorn session and someone's gonna pick me. I was ashamed of that. I didn't wanna be the next one. Or, you know, when I didn't do my homework sometimes, I remember times where I was excluded from field trips and how that really made me feel outcast and made me feel like I wasn't worth it of my of, of, of being able to do this thing. So I think for me, it was more like the, the not being uh, provided equity and equality education and, and, and the school and the system adapting to me to really figure, making sure that I'm getting the support that I needed, you know, and just to, and I recall one time when they even had my mom come into the classroom, sit next to me, which was so embarrassing, you know? So it's like, to me, there was a misconception that they kept labeling me a troubled kid because of where I came from and because of my inconsistency, but not understanding the real root of it all. So I think that's what the face that the, the challenge that I face as a young individual in the system of uh, education. Yeah, thanks for that. I, and I think that that's something that we, we, we've we all known so many students that, um, that have felt isolated, have felt like they haven't received that support and, and really just, I think you shed some really important um, information out there for our educators about how important it is to adapt to our students. Let's, thank you for that. And uh, Ms. Murray, why don't you, uh, you're, you've got a different perspective as a parent, as a mother to a child with a, with a disability. Can you, can you speak about what your son encountered while he was going through the education system? First off, can, can you hear me okay? I had a text that I was a little low, okay. Um, yes, my son came into kindergarten already, already with diagnosis of mild autism and soon after ADHD. And the biggest misconception we encountered was that, and so he already had an IEP, he already had you know, qualified for special education uh, assistance. But the biggest misconception we faced was that everybody attributed everything to the labels he already had. And nobody, even myself, thought to look beyond that and say, is there another reason that he's not learning to read? And having those labels in place um, got him certain kinds of help, but at the same time prevented people from looking deeper to say, why is this kid not learning to read? And he experienced a, a great degree of extreme frustration that led to a lot of behavioral issues. And nobody thought to look beyond the labels. They said, oh, this kid has ADHD. That's why he's misbehaving. He has autism. That's why he's misbehaving. Um, but a lot of the, root of the, the misbehavior was actually his frustration, extreme frustration from being able to look around and seeing all the other kids doing what he couldn't do. Um, and it was really telling that once we did get him the right kind of help, um, a lot of that frustration went away. And so I look around and I see all these other kids that are acting out, being labeled behavioral problems, being labeled you know, with ADHD issues. Uh, many of them may have ADHD. About half of the kids with ADHD also have dyslexia. But the tendency of schools is to blame it all on the ADHD and not to look deeper and say, what else needs fixing? And I think you touched on, I think everybody kind of touched on that important point of uh, some of the manifestations that result from, you know, being identified as a troublemaker when really it's just not really, we're not getting to the root of the problem. This child can't read, this child feels shame, this child is being placed in a, an environment where they're not being supported. Um, and that, and that's, that's a really important 
thing that educators need to be aware of. So I wanna move on to our uh, next question, which is at what point, Dr. Anderson, did you realize that reading and writing were more challenging for you than your peers? Was there a moment or? So in my early education, I didn't really recognize that it was reading and writing. I sort of thought collectively I was just a bad student. Um, I'd come home and I wouldn't understand the homework assignment. And it just, it, my mom was like, you were there today. What did you learn? And I'm like, this, it didn't make any sense. I was so unsure of it. So I came home early in my education and I didn't have the words to be able to explain. So sort of like um, to Ms. Murray's point, I was frustrated and acting out in accordance with being frustrated because I didn't have the vocabulary to say, hey, this is the misconnect. In fact, I didn't even understand it. It was just like, she was talking. It didn't make any sense. I don't know what I was supposed to walk away with. And then after I sort of became more knowledgeable of the fact that it was more reading and that I enjoyed math, then I was able to specify to my mom, like, I just don't like these types of tasks. Like, I don't like history because there's a lot of this reading and writing component to it that I'm not really good at. So for me, it was sort of realizing at that point. And then by the time I got to like seven, um, I was, I would wake up in the middle of the night because I came home from school to stress and I wake up in the middle of the night and I would watch these crazy infomercials. And I still think they're kind of crazy now, but the kids, they were learning how to read. And I just was frustrated. And I actually have like a picture of that in my book, just watching the kids. And you see like, they're like, this kid is six months old and they've already learned a thousand words and they know all of this stuff. So like for me, really, as I got older, I was able to explain it. And then I recognized sort of those moments. Um, Mr. Mendoza said this, but popcorn reading, I hated it. I made it all the way to grad school. Like, I hear what you're saying. I'm not reading out loud because that comes with way too much anxiety. And not, I think, feel like sometimes for other people, there's this, well, you made it to this point, so you move past that. But the imposter syndrome is real. Um, and at every point in my education where someone's like, okay, so we're going to do this thing and everybody's going to get involved, my anxiety shoots through the roof. And it's like, I do not want to participate in this thing that's going to make me feel isolated and make me feel ashamed all over again. I mean, that, that seems to be a common emotion, uh, that shame. Um, so Mr. Rodriguez, can you share about when, at what moment or, or when did you realize that there was something wrong you, you couldn't, there was some difference in your ability to read as opposed to your peers? I realized right away, like in first grade, uh, what's the, the disconnect that is difficult is you, you feel smart inside, but the way they're trying to uh, give you our information, it doesn't work for you. And the harder, like, you know, the teacher would say, you're just not trying hard enough. You need to work harder. And I would stay up even in first grade late at night because I didn't want to be, you know, the dumb kid and I would work hard. You know, I felt like I was working two or three times harder than all the other kids, but with very little results. And then that was frustrating. But even through all of that, like, I have like, I think dyslexia, you have like an eternal optimism where you still feel uh, smart inside. But, you know, if the only way you're able to show that you're smart is what you write on paper, uh, and that's one of the things that you struggle the most with, that puts you at a, at a horrible disadvantage. So, uh, you know, like I said, I learned, you know, right away uh, that I was struggling with it. And I tried over the years, first, second, third, but you try to figure it out. Because even though they're saying that kid's less than, he's not that smart, you don't feel that way inside. You know, you're like, no, I, I understand. I just, you're just struggling to kind of, how are you going to show it when the only way they, they allow you to show that you're smart is write it down. And that's the thing that, that struggles for you. So that was like the conflict that I had, but you learn, you see that you're different. Are you uh, right away? I would say first grade. So like measuring someone's intelligence, just using one, one metric, right? And not really looking at um, the different strengths that yeah. the individual have or has. Um, Mr. Mendoza, can you, can you tell us about uh, your experience? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think for me, I mean, I would say that 
most of those experiences happened in elementary for me where I was feeling ashamed, outcast, and not worth it uh, of, of, my, of the education I was getting because of how they were treating me and how I felt. But I think for me, it was more, as soon as I hit sixth grade, I started to realize that uh, as, that I, I felt like I wasn't uh, able to do these things because, you know, in sixth grade, everything's different now. Now you have periods, you know, period one, two, three. Uh, and then um, what I started to realize there is that there was, that I started to realize that I wasn't capable of these things because I also ran into other young individuals that were just like me, had uh, come from Mexico, Salvador, Guatemala, from different countries. They were ESL students themselves. And they had very similarities as to me. They have no father figures in their lives. And they were just like, kind of like feeling the same way I felt. So I started kind of like affiliating myself with uh, the troubled youth, I would say more often because, you know, I felt that that was where I felt more comfortable with these individuals that didn't know how to speak English, didn't know, they were dealing with the same issues I was dealing with. So I felt comfortable with them because, uh, and then not only that, I started realizing this because now by this point, I was already labeled a troubled kid, a troubled student. So I was fitting off that label more now of that troubled student label and trying to claim that more because I felt like I could claim that more than I could claim being an actual A student or something like that. I could be a troubled kid and probably be better at doing that than being this smart student that wants to be a student. But because there's nothing in place for me, uh, I can really become that smart student because I probably cannot be that. Um, so I guess that's what I started to realize at that age, uh, at sixth grade, seventh grade, where everything started going more downhill for me when it comes to my academia and, uh, and being in touch, uh, in contact with law enforcement and stuff like that. Can you, can you share, Ms. Murray, how, when you realize that your son was struggling with reading and writing? Um, well, first I want to tell you when, when he realized, when he was in first grade, he told me, mom, it feels like the teacher's an airplane and all the other kids are getting on the airplane and I'm left stuck on the runway. And I said to him, well, that's because all the other kids are airplanes and you're a helicopter. And we're just gonna have to learn to do things a little bit differently. Um, but the, the real time, he had really severe uh, behavioral issues to the point where we had to pull him out of school and place him in a special school for kids with, with uh, Asperger's syndrome. And once he got to that school, within three months, all the behavioral issues were gone, but he still wasn't learning to read. And we had gone through a bunch of, you know, hooked on phonics, progressive phonics, reading eggs. He finished all 120 levels of reading eggs without learning to read. And one day he was working on one of these online programs and he sounds out time, t I, mm, mile. And I said, something's wrong. Something's wrong. I know this is not right. And that's, uh, I, I really started doing my research and insisted on getting the kind of testing he needed to find out what was wrong. And Dr. Anderson, I, I saw you, uh, your, you know, your nonverbals. I mean, do, is there something that you want to add to that? I, I did notice you had a reaction. It was, it was the basic breaking down of the word and being able to understand sort of, I don't know the technical term, it's escaping me right now, but being able to break down the word so that he could say it. So when I heard you share this story and how he broke up time, it was like, okay, so he's decoding the word in order to understand it. And when you have the rules of decoding, then it makes reading in the English language make more sense because there are tons of words that absolutely just don't make any sense. Um, so being able to have those basic skills for me were transformative and they're still skills that I use today. Yeah. Uh, and so the next question I wanna uh, ask you all is uh, Dr. Anderson, can you please tell us um, what barriers to learning did you face as a student? I know you kind of talked You've been talking about some of these barriers, but can you can you break it down for us? What are some of these barriers that that you feel really were impediments to your learning? Um, I think the first barrier that I that I can think of is having people who are paying attention. Um, so, like it, in my time in the classroom and working with students, I feel like if you're paying attention enough, there are some telltale indicators 
that something may be a little different. So if I walk into a classroom, even if I don't know who has an IEP or sort of some of the learning challenges that are there, I'm able to pick up very quickly like, oh, I saw you do this thing. And I can ask questions in order to get clarity or sort of work with a kiddo to, to see that. And I think that unfortunately, sometimes in general ed settings, teachers are sort of thinking about how to teach to the mass and they're not necessarily looking at some of those smaller things. I even noticed those things as a professor, like, oh, I noticed that I did this and it took you a little longer to write down your note. Like, do you need extended time? Have you thought about these things? So um, for me, having professionals who are paying attention, um, recognizing that the process needs to be unique. Um, I'm really advocating across the board for an equitable education system where kids get what they need. Um, I don't know why that's such a strange concept for so many people, but um, being able to sort of go away with the idea that we can just fit all kids in the same model and produce success because it just doesn't work that way. Right. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, you want to chime in? Yes. Yeah. To build on that, uh, my problem, you know, being dyslexic and I also have ADHD is, you know, how you get information, how you learn is through reading. That's how they give you everything. And I, I would say the most freeing moment it didn't happen until I was in college is I mean, having audiobooks. And now I read or you know, ear, ear read books, everything. I try to absorb as much knowledge as I, I can possibly get. And that's you know, one of the, the greatest thing. And the point is like the barrier is all your information is coming through reading. And if that's your main disability, that's also another, uh, I guess makes it difficult, but if you're having, and now with all the technology and everything, cause I have, you know, I have two kids, I have a, a second grader and then I have a, a three-year-old preschooler. Um, those things that are coming now, especially audiobooks, are probably the most freeing things that I can possibly say in my life for being dyslexic, having that is fantastic. Be able to get information in a way that you can just absorb it like a sponge. So. Yeah, that access that accessibility is is key, especially with um, access to audiobooks. I think that's that's really wonderful for students to get the vocabulary and context and, and background information. Um, Mr. Mendoza, I you know I think I'd love for you to talk about some of the barriers that you faced too. I know we talked about or you shared with me about your you know uh, your experience. I want you to share that with us. Um. Yeah, I mean, I feel like I had many barriers, uh, you know, in my journey. Uh, but I think just like the fact that I was poor, the fact that I didn't have no father figure, uh, the fact that, you know, my mom was very poor herself, that was a barrier itself. Uh, and, you know, I think that just not having people that understood me and really looked for, like, you know, when they saw me missing class or when they saw me uh, missing an assignment, nobody ever came up to me like, hey, Ken, what's going on? What's going on? Why are you you're not turning in your homework? It was always mostly like negative responses to my to the way to what I did. Uh, so I feel like that was my barrier mostly, just not people really not understanding me and not really reaching out to me. And and also I felt like once I became this criminalized youth or this troubled labeled youth, uh, things were given to me. Like nobody asked me what I wanted. Nobody asked me like, hey Ken, do you do you want to skate? Do you like biology? Do you like all these things? Because in, as a young kid, I like all these things. I used to love skating. I used to be intrigued by a lot of things that I used to read about, but, or learn about, but nobody ever pushed me further on those areas. Nobody ever uh, tried to tap into that curiosity, you know? Uh, if anything, it just died out over time. And I think that that was the barrier that nobody really understood where I came from. And that's why we used the word outcast. I always felt out outcast during my entire education experience because nobody ever took the time to come up, come to me and let, ask me like, what do I really want and how can we support you? No teacher, no tutor. Uh, and, and my parents couldn't even do it because my mom, like I said, was by herself, single mother, uh, trying to make it in this country. So I think that that was the barrier, simply just being poor and not having people really reach out to me to try to understand me for who I was and what I was going through at home. And, and so I think that's the main barrier that I faced. Uh, and just over that, I think just, 
the juvenile justice system coming into my life too, that also was a barrier. You know, once you're in the juvenile justice system at a young age, it's hard to get off it. You know, if anything, you start excelling within it instead of actually getting out of it. Uh, in the school, sometimes push you more further into the system instead of getting you away from it. So I think that was the barrier, just educators and faculties not understanding my population uh, and how to deal with us and work with us. Right. And Ms. Bury, why don't you tell us about some of the experiences that your, your son had with barriers to his education? I think, I think the biggest barrier was just that teachers don't know what they don't know. Um, there's a lot of knowledge out there about dyslexia and about the signs and symptoms, and they were all there for somebody that knew what to look for, but the teachers had never been trained to look for it. The teachers had, hadn't been trained on um, the best ways to teach reading. I, his first grade teacher was telling the kids to look at the pictures and guess, and that's not effective. Um, the, once he got into the special needs school, um, and, and finally we were able to get some help, the director lamented, she said, oh, we really didn't wanna be a phonics shop. And so just, just we need the teachers to know these things so they can help the kids. Absolutely. And I think your website is a great source as well. Uh, you put that together. Can you tell us really quickly what, why, how that came about? Well, there's, there's the saying that a worried mother does better research than the FBI. <laughs> I'm a bit of a work bookworm. So my first instinct was just to go read everything I could get my hands on, to watch every video I could get my hands on, and just really dig into this, why is my kid not learning to read? And as I did that, I, I kind of amassed a collection of, of really good resources. And I kept, I was on a, some support groups uh, on Facebook and I kept finding myself like cutting and pasting. Oh, you need to read this. Oh, you need to read that. Oh, you need to watch this. And originally I thought, okay, well, I'm gonna just make a list of all these things so I could just send people my list. And the list just got longer and longer and longer. And then I decided, well, I should turn this into a website. Then I could just give them the link to the website. And then I realized a lot of kids who, have, who are dyslexic, dyslexic is very hereditary, um, a lot of their parents are dyslexic and they're not gonna wanna read a lot of stuff. So I said, let me go find the videos that the dyslexic parents can watch so that they don't have to read everything to learn about this. And, and it just grew from there. I, I organized everything into kind of categories so that, that wherever you are on your journey from figuring out, is my child dyslexic? How do I get testing? How do I get help? What's actually going on in the brain? Um, what is an IEP? How do I get one? What's a 504 plan? Um, I, I made a page for each of these things and it, it just grew from there. Great website and great resources for parents. Um, I wanna move on. I'm sorry, some, John, did you wanna add to that? Just quickly, I wanted to Go add ahead. Go right ahead. Uh, I was really taught poorly in elementary school, just to add on to uh, what you had to say. Uh, as my daughter was learning phonograms, which is fantastic, I actually, so many years later, learned how to pronounce words properly because I had never learned how to say things, you know, struggling with words. I just wanted to just say like phonograms are like a fantastic. I know there are multiple resources, but uh, that is like uh, another like really enlightening thing. So as you learn to read in first grade and second grade, so. Thanks for sharing that resource. Also, um, I guess the next question for, for you, I'll start again with Dr. Anderson. How did your school respond to your reading challenges? So a couple of different ways. Um, when I first started, uh, I received these packages um, with like the alphabet on it and very simple words and like a fill in the blank sort of thing. I guess in my mind, I would compare that to sort of like um, an independent learning style. So we would go to class, we would have some sort of lesson plan, and then there would be a packet that I was sent home with. Um, as I went through and I made it to high school, my teacher was a little more specific in integrating material that I could relate to. So like I read the Blueprint series, um, great books for high school students. Um, and which also is sort of what cued me up to write books that were appropriate for younger children. Cause I thought if I had I had books like this, I might've been a little bit 
more <clears throat> interested in reading when I was younger. But um, as I got to that point, now I heard Mr. Rodriguez say this and Ms. Murray, when I got to college, audible books? <laughs> what? No takers? <laughs> Additional time for exams? It was, it was madness, <laughs> the amount of resources that were available once I made it to college. And I'm thinking like, these things couldn't have just come out of thin air in one year. From graduating high school and then going into college, like there were all of these resources that were absolutely amazing that could have helped me become a better student years before I got to that point. But in the K-12 setting, it was like, oh, these are additional advantages that you shouldn't have, like a note taker. I'm not going to give you the teacher's notes so that as you're trying to decode your notes, which you poorly write because you can't listen to them and write your notes at the same time because your brain is having a hard time processing this. Um, it, was, it was madness to me to see how liberating it was once I got to college. And it was sort of like, how is this not a thing that exists before now? So I was excited to hear that for a couple of you that it exists for your kids because I think it would have helped me a long time ago. Yeah. Can I, and I mean, can I add on to that? You know, uh, just really briefly is like, when you learn, like you get the information in the way you learn. I, you know, I went from a F, D, at my best, I was getting a C minus. If I got a C minus, I was celebrating. But when you're getting information the way you learn and they know how it works, within a year and a half, you go from, the horrible grades to A's and B's. And then in about a year later, you're getting all A's because you know the way you learn. So that's significant. And that's just building what, you know, Mr. Anderson, uh, Dr. Anderson said and what my experience is. So it's significant, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I think that's just leveling the playing field, right? So making sure that everybody has what they need in order to access their education uh, Mr. Mendoza, why don't you share with us uh, what, like, what, how, how your school responded? I mean, we kind of heard some of some of this, uh, some of these experiences, but you want to elaborate on on how the school responded to your reading challenges? I mean, your your inability to um, to access your your education. Yeah, I mean, I feel that. Well, I mean, I wasn't. There was no positive response to my. Uh, barriers as, an, as a non-English speaker. I think, like I said, there was negative responses to my situation. Uh, you know, I was never given a, a special tutor. I was never put in on, on a special, I don't remember ever, I don't recall ever being on a special type of class or like special lead or anything like that. I was always just kept on the same classroom. I felt like they just, I think that's a misconception. They think that we're gonna figure things out somehow. Like we're just gonna just somehow just come the next day and already knowing these things or that somehow we have people at home waiting for us to help us on these things. Or I feel like that was the expectations from the schools, but it was never like that. Uh, if anything, like I mentioned in the past, it was just, uh, we just kept um, failing the class, getting poor grades. Uh, and just that just kept fitting my my identity as a student in, in school, with whatever school I was. Uh, I ended up getting uh, expelled from eighth grade, you know. Uh, so everything started becoming uh, bad for me. Like I, at that point, I started just kind of giving up on school uh, by the time I hit eighth grade when I got kicked out. Uh, so I, I would say that, uh, yeah, I guess it was not a good response. And even when I was in juvenile hall, you know, by that time when I was in juvenile hall already, uh, I remember getting packages in juvenile hall too, like to read and that was my education. So it really, when I was in, in juvenile hall, it really, everything that had happened in elementary and middle school, I started to see how, why it was important that I received quality education for now, because now I was in, in, in juvenile hall, trying to get my, trying to, learning sixth grade education, seventh grade education in juvenile hall, already at 15, 16, 17 years of age. All of these things that I would have, should have been knowing at, uh, in elementary, I'm barely learning them now in juvenile hall. So it was, that's when I started also to realize that uh, because the school didn't respond to my situation at a young age, you know, obviously I made mistakes, but at the end of the day, the system failed me as well. And now I was in, in, the, in, in, the, in the justice system trying to get the same education I couldn't get in the free world, which is nothing better than the one uh, that I was getting. So I think that 
uh, that's another factor that uh, I, I started to realize too, as I was in the justice system, realizing like, damn, I'm really behind on all of this stuff as well. And I think that you, you, you kind of raise an interesting point too, in the sense that, you know, we do have families that can afford private tutoring, mm -hmm. uh, that can afford to get Barton tutor, whatever type of support that their child needs. Uh, but when you come from a poor community, when you, when your parents are, are struggling, you don't have access to tutors. Uh, and so I think that that's also an issue of equity as well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, Dr. Anderson, go ahead, chime in, please. I, I thought that there there was something interesting there um, and what um, Mendoza said, Mr. Mendoza said, because it made me think of the adage, the blind leading the blind, where we see students who have a need for different accommodations and they go into these spaces where they're expected as children to be able to verbalize that this is my specific need and this is how I can get it and this is how I can access it in ways that works for me. And I think for me, it's like, how could we expect that kids would be able to do that? Mm -hmm. Like you don't become a heart surgeon without first going to med school. And I think that sometimes the responsibility is heavily placed on the student in ways that just don't logically make sense. Like it isn't fair to like to be asked like, well, you should know how to access the material, who taught me? Where did I gather these invisible skills? And like just really being able to acknowledge that the earnest has to fall on those who are educating. Mm -hmm. Good point. Uh, Mr. Rodriguez, what, what do you think about that? What um, Dr. Anderson just shared and Mr. Mendoza, I mean, do you have, a, do you have any, any? There's not, uh, you know, yeah, it's not an, an equal equity. Mm -hmm. you're at a, a, a disadvantage. I mean, you need, that's what the, you know, also, uh, you know, we marched on, on DC. Mm -hmm. What's really important is they don't, you know, if you're an ESL student, they don't identify you. If, you, you, if you're ESL and you have mm -hmm. dyslexia or other things, they don't even identify you. There is not, that is like a huge thing, especially in California. So there's so many different, groups that they and the key is you got to get identified in first grade so that you know equity that's like the main thing equity uh and getting the help that you need so yeah good point and and miss murray why don't you tell us uh what some of the uh, how the school responded when you raised these issues or when your when your son was having these difficulties well, equally, first, the first thing is to get identified. But even after a child is identified, it's equally, if not more important, to get the right kind of instruction. And what happened with my son was that uh, in first grade, the behavioral issues got so bad that they decided the school wanted him out of the classroom. They wanted to move him into a special education class. Um, and somebody tipped me off, my, the first grade teacher, actually said, I'm, I'm not sure if you're gonna like the reading program they're using in that class. So as a parent, I asked, I said, I would like to look at the reading program. And I got the manual and I read through it. And this reading program was intended for intellectually disabled children who are deemed unable to learn phonics. They were only gonna teach him 50 words in one year. And this to me was completely unacceptable. Um, the classroom was gonna have children from first all the way through fifth grade and I asked, I said, I want to observe this classroom that you're proposing to put him into. So I went and I, I looked and as I'm observing the classroom, they, they give you about 20 minutes with, with an administrator there. I noticed the books on the wall and they had the system where they labeled the books from you know, A to Z. And I said, wait a minute, there are fourth and fifth graders in this classroom and these books only go to K. You know, how can this be equitable? How can you be, it doesn't look like you're actually intending to teach these children to read, you're not expecting these children to ever be able to learn to read. Um, and so that was, was part of why we ended up pulling him out of school. Um, but this is an equity issue. We were in a position that we were able to do that. I could homeschool. Eventually I, I found a school that we could pay for privately, but not every family has those resources. Not every family has the ability to pull their kids out and homeschool if they need to, or to pay for a private school. And it's a huge equity issue. Um, we need to make sure that that there are avenues for people who don't have the money to get what they need. 
Right. And I think too, I, I think another common theme I'm hearing is these low expectations for our students and a lack of ambitious goals, right? We don't expect you to achieve more than this, right? Like, I think that's, that's, that's awful. And, and it has a huge impact on, on the child on there. And, and it, and I think, you know, Dr. Anderson talked about that imposter syndrome and, you know, it does follow you. Um, I know Mr. Mendoza talked about that shame as well uh, in the classroom. So what, what support Dr. Anderson, do you wish that you would have received when you were in school? And you kind of, you, you did talk about some of those things, but can you, can you let us know what some of those things you just really wish, I wish I would have had this when I needed it. Um, I'm just gonna ramble them off. Um, I think Audible would have been great. I think having a note taker would have been great. Um, they, that comes in a few different forms. You could have someone in class take notes. You could have a pen, a, a techno technology pen where it records and you're able to go back and listen to it later. Um, those things would have been beneficial for me. A tutor would have been beneficial to me. Somebody to really say, hey, so I see you, you're lagging here. Let's try to catch you back up on this non-school assigned time. Um, so sometimes they utilize this pullout method where I guess in 45 minutes, it was supposed to make me more prepared, but then I missed 45 minutes of instruction. Um, so those sorts of things, technology, thinking about other ways to be innovative. I wish long before I got to the point where they threw the packets away that they would have thrown the packets away because you can't ask the packets questions. Um, they're not <laughs> that user friendly. So thinking of ways where it could have been a more comprehensive and holistic learning environment, um, yeah. Those are the things I wish I had at that time. Mr. Rodriguez, you want to ch chime in? Uh, technology has gotten fantastic, as Mr. Uh, Dr. Anderson has said, over the, especially over the last five years. What makes that, you know, I can bring it into Mr. Mendoza, what makes that great and equitable is it's free. Mm -hmm. Like Microsoft, Google, all those things, Apple, all the technology, but key to that is, what good is the technology if there's not someone teaching the kids how to use it? That will free them up and there will be, they will be limitless if they're using the different, I mean, technology and how to use it well. Not just audible, but speech to text. All these things I use. And like, um, also in email, you know, what, what's really popular, like in Silicon Valley, I have a lot of friends up there is, no one writes emails anymore. They have a, a program where, you know, they just do a video. The email is a video, they tape it. And it's probably almost everybody uses that in like Silicon Valley and other places. It's more efficient. And I would also argue, not only is it better to have like audio books, but they're more efficient. You get through more material quicker and you're able to absorb it in a, a quicker manner, so. I think like you mentioned, the training is important because sometimes what I see is the schools will just say, here, here's this technology. And then the teachers are not trained in that technology. The students are, are not trained properly in how to use it. Um, so I think that you make a really, make really good points. Uh, Mr. Mendoza, can you, can you share, um, you know, what, what support do you wish that you would have uh, received? Yeah, I mean, obviously, like everybody has mentioned, technology will be helpful. Obviously, in that time when I was going to through the school system, none of that technology existed. But I think what would have helped me, honestly, I think I would have had like, I think like a tutor as well, you know, maybe not a tutor, but like a mentor, someone that mm -hmm. can be there with me and, and really guide me through the process of understanding the materials and making it more sexy and catchier, right? Like the materials and the work. Uh, and I also think that going back to the equity question uh, or the conversation, I think that what would have helped me, you know, like I remember being a young kid and there was many things that I always wanted to do. I remember at one point I wanted to be a pro skater. I remember at one point I wanted to be an artist, like I wanted to draw and become a famous artist. At one point I wanted to join the Marines. You know, these are just examples of things that I really wanted to do as a kid. Uh, and I think that what I would have needed, if there would have been some type of programs or if the education were 
figure out ways where they could talk about what do I want and invest in those things. Because if I would have told the school, that, hey, I want to be an artist, I want to be, I want to paint and want to be an artist. Maybe from that age, at the age of seven, the school could start investing in that potential. And never, next thing you know, maybe by the time I'm 15, I'm already a, a good artist. By the time I'm 18, I'm already going to college for an art school. Or by the time I'm 22, I'm already a big time artist. Or by the time I'm in 15, or I'm a pro skater because they invested in my, in my skating stuff. Or because I wanted to be a teacher. Or I wanted to be a biologist. I, I like biology. So investing, so I feel like I would have, would have needed someone, the system to really invest in what I wanted to do mm -hmm. and what captured my attention at that age at the, and invest in, invest in my curiosity and really, because I feel that that's ultimately would have what, what could have avoided me entering the system of incarceration at the, at the age of 14, which is still a very young age. So I think that for me, it would be just uh, mentors, uh, people that can support me in the processes and, 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 and investment in the curiosity that I had as a young individual. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, it's so sad that we don't foster the creativity, the, 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 the things that children are interested in, those passions um, that our kids have. Uh, Ms. Burry, tell us about what, what your, uh, what, what do you have to say about what you've heard, uh, what's your contribution to this conversation about what we've been talking about? I think it's it's key um, to have the, I don't know, if, if the question was, um, what do I wish had been in place? Mm -hmm. I wish there had been earlier screening. Mm -hmm. um, the signs were there in kindergarten. I mean, my son did get help starting in second grade, but he could have come out and help two years earlier. Mm -hmm. And the earlier that help starts, the better it works. Mm -hmm. So that's would have been top of my wish list for mm -hmm. to get to be screened earlier, but then also to have the type of instruction he needed earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I wanna I wanna ask you all because I, I you know, Ms. Mendoza talked about the you know a mentor, and I think that uh, we can all think back to somebody who, who, who spoke words to us that inspired us, that made us um, see a, a, a vision of ourselves that perhaps we didn't see. And I'm wondering, Dr. Anderson, is there a mentor that you can, um, can you can think of? I know you talked about, I think it was Miss O. Uh, if you, I mean, if that's a person, can you tell us about that? Why was that so important? Miss O, um, in addition to being an absolutely phenomenal teacher, she had conversations with me that translated to real life practicability. Um, while we were in the mid, I was in the midst of frustration about trying to gather these skills, she pointed out the necessity of these skills. Um, while I was in school, there was a girl in uh, my ninth grade class who was pregnant. And she's like, what if your baby's allergic to something? How do you read the ingredients? Like you really got to put the pedal to the metal here and make sure that you develop these skills because you don't want to unintentionally harm your baby. Um, or where are you going to work? Because even to work at, you know, a fast food restaurant, you have to be able to read the menu. So I think for her, because she operated from this, um, this tough love utopia where she was never harsh, but it was very much like you have to decide what future you want. And sort of to Mr. Rodriguez's point, you have to be willing to put the additional work in, even if you're outworking everybody else in the room, because at the end of all of this, it's gonna be about the life that you want. And for me, that was transformative because for the first time, not only was I sort of being given this choice, but I was given the tools in order to make it possible. So I want the future, these are the steps, this is the work that I have to do. Even though I gotta do a lot more work than some of my peers, it's worth it if I get to have the life that I want. So she was a, a big stakeholder. And then from there, I've had a number of countless mentors who affirmed me in all sorts of ways. Miss um, Dr. Perlu, who now graduated from USC Fight On, um, Dr. Gamble, um, a number of other people who really just stood up and let me know that I could actually achieve the things that I wanted to go after, even if they seem unrealistic by any measure of the world that I knew before that point. Yeah, uh, Mr. Rodriguez. Yeah, <laughs> I, I can't stress. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mendoza, for bringing that up. Mentors, my life 
from first grade to 16 was complete miserable. I hated myself. I hated my life. Every day in school, I felt I was getting, you know, kind of beat up by words, constantly just miserable. I had had enough. You know, I think you, Mr. Mendoza said eighth grade, he had had enough, but I had had enough. And then I dropped out of high school at 16. But that semester I had like an ROP class and I met, uh, I was working by Disneyland in the kitchen uh, and his name was uh, Chef Charles Collins. Uh, I met him and he became my mentor. I was supposed to be there for two weeks and I was wandering around because I had never seen the back of a kitchen and I turned the corner and I was somewhere where I shouldn't be. And I ran into him and he was making this incredible ice carving. It was like out of a 300 pound block of ice. And he took me under his wing, this miserable kid who had nothing but failure his whole life. And he taught me how to sculpt ice. And from that day forward, fantastic. And why I say stressing how significant a mentor is, they'll take you under their wing. They'll show you the way. That, that's that extra guidance. And then one thing led to another. I kind of think, when I met him, 16, when I had dropped out of high school, meeting him and teaching me all those things was like the trajectory what ended up at Harvard and all the other places and everything else good that happened to me from that day. One thing, the next thing, fantastic, fantastic. You know, meeting my wife, getting married, having kids, all the other things, it was that. So I, mentors, I am just so grateful because just to even think where my life would have been if I hadn't met him. It's just, yeah, heartbreaking. So very significant. Mr. Mendoza, tell us about the mentors that helped you. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I feel I agree with with, with both uh, Rodriguez and Dr. Anderson about the mentor. I think that, uh, uh, you know, I think that I never had real mentors until I was already, it was already too late for me. Uh, the first time I had a mentor was when I was 17 years of age. Uh, in juvenile hall, I was 17 years of age, facing 25 to life in prison. I was tried as I was being tried as an adult, uh, just for the mistakes that I made as a young kid. Uh, and I think that I was in the darkest moments of my life during that time. I was 17 years of age. I remember being in my cell, uh, crying at nine, trying to find my why, my purpose of why I was locked up in the first place. Why did my mom come from Mexico all the way to this country to get my education? And now here I am in a cell, potentially about to die and behind this cell for the rest of my life. And, you know, I met my mentor during that moment, during that dark moment, someone that actually the founder of the organization that I work for, Scott Budnick, who's the founder of the Anti-Recidivism Coalition, before ARC existed, he was going inside juvenile halls to basically teach a writing class, a reading and writing class, reading poetry, reading lyrics, and writing about them, reading books and writing about them. And this guy went into this facility and from that day on, he just kept coming back, you know, and, and at first, you know, I always used to look at him as a weird white guy coming into the facility to see me. Because remember, as a young kid that comes from the neighborhood in the poor community, you don't see a lot of white people just coming out of nowhere want to help you. So when he, when he came to the juvenile hall to see me that one day, you know, I try to push him away because he kept coming back every single weekend and I would push him away because I didn't trust him. But then I realized that, you know what? I've never had a father figure in my life. All the male figures and role models that I look up to all my life were all bad. And here's this white guy that see, coming to see me that somehow makes me feel good about myself, gives me hope and sees me not for the gang label or for, my, for how I look because of the tattoos or whatever, but sees me as a young kid that wants is broken. So that was the first time I had a mentor. And from that day on, like uh, you, Rodriguez, I haven't gotten married, none of those things, but my life was amazing after that. Even though I was still locked up, that mentor gave me hope. He gave me confidence. He saw, he gave me the acknowledgement that I always wanted in my life. And I think from that day on, that mm -hmm. mentor really excelled. And here I am now, I work for his organization. And thanks to him, I have many other amazing mentors that have been giving me exposure to different and bigger things. And yeah, so I think that that really played a big role in my overall uh, transition in the free world. And now I, as a still young individual, I mentor other young people now. So I think that real mentors are crucial for any type of you, whether it's 
education and the justice system, it don't matter. I feel like just mentors, uh, being able to put things in perspective, like you just said, Mr. Anderson, Dr. Anderson, is what really gets gets to what we want to get to when it comes to our youth, you know, putting it in perspective and being real to each other. So I think that, yeah, that's where my journey with mentors really helped me. And, and I strongly believe in mentorship and should be a component that should be in place in every system that we could think of that deals with youth. And, and you know what, Ms. Murray, tell us about your son, because I know he has a lot of great interests. And I wonder what, what about him? Did he, did he encounter any mentors along the way? I'm, I'm not sure. I need to ask him about that. And, and listening to all these gentlemen makes me think, oh, I need to really make sure that he's in high school now, that he gets hooked up with someone that can really inspire him. Um, but I can talk about a little bit of different type of mentorship. And this is mentorship between parents. Um, one of the things that helped me the most was finding a support group online of other parents who had been there and who could give me advice on, oh yeah, that happened to my son. My son was dyslexic. Here's how I got him help. Here's how my daughter, um, how we get, got accommodations from the school. Here's how the process works. Here's where you can go. These are the good doctors in town. These are the good people who know how to treat this. Um, Finding a network of parents is key. Finding other parents who have been there, whose children who have been there, um, can you can just mine them for like all kinds of information. There's um, support groups online. You could just go on Facebook, Google for dyslexia, look for decoding dyslexia has a closed Facebook group. And in the closed Facebook groups, the parents tell it how it is. You can go and, and say, you know, I need to find an advocate. I need to find a lawyer. I need, I need to know, is this, type of remediation any good or not and uh, the parents who've been there they can tell you yeah definitely um, just really building that network and I'm and and Tanya and Ms. Murray has been a very great uh, resource for me and and uh, and I'm so appreciative she she was one of the first persons that um, started me along this this journey um, so I thank her for that as well as all the other wonderful people that are doing this work so absolutely co connect with each other. And I, I uh, Mr. Rodriguez, I, I saw you. It looked like you kind of wanted to chime in there. Uh, yeah, to build like mentors and to build on what everyone is saying is like, I live in California. So the two huge industries that I have a lot of friends and I do it, like events with, like the movie industry, and I'm sure you're from, uh, familiar. So there is uh, Jonathan Mooney and some of the other people are doing, uh, what is it called? The internships, not internships, but you're getting paid, you're working on the movie sets for every single um, movie company or your animation company, they do that. So if there's like a, you know, a parent out there, they can shoot me an email, or if you wanna go uh, the events at the Facebook, you know, camp, campus in Menlo Park or Google, I don't know, I know only a few people at Apple, but some of the other tech companies or if, if they want to get together and they're, they're starting a tech and they want a different tech houses. My wife and I lived in the Bay Area for eight years. I still have a lot of great friends out there in the tech company. So like, if I, in a little way, can help out, someone shoots me an email and I'm like, hey, this is a great kid here, uh, you know, go talk with this person. That I just want to offer that as something at least in those industries that I know a lot of people. I don't know in all the industries, but those I, I'm pretty well informed, so. Yeah, yeah thanks. thanks for that. I, I, wanna, I wanna pivot to something um, that, that's really um, important to talk about. I, I wanna talk about, or want you to talk about how your uh, challenges, your reading difficulties, how did that impact you mentally that the mental health aspect of of your struggles and i'll start with dr Ann. um so for me i'm in therapy um i know that that's sort of a, a kind of controversial thing to talk about but um i had a lot of trauma associated with learning um and expectations of teachers and sort of like this, this goodwill taunting that I experienced. Well, this is what a good student looks like. And if you would just try harder, you would be able to succeed like everyone else. And it's like, you're, you're speaking to me in French, which I don't speak. And you're telling me that if I listen hard enough that eventually I'm just gonna get the French. And you're not giving me any of the fundamental tools and be, to be able to understand. So for me, there was a, 
there was a lot of trauma associated with how I engage with educators and then trying to navigate around, well, who is safe and who's my advocate and who could stand in and be a broker in the conversation as I've already been outcast as not a great student, sometimes a troublemaker, I'm not paying attention and I just don't care. Um, so for me, it was the, the messaging that was integrated into who I thought I was and happened to go through the process of decoding that because I was never a bad student. I've always wanted to learn. I just didn't learn like everyone else. So that was uh, a big uphill battle for me um, as a student. And it's something that I'm very conscious of as an educator, um, because I think that sometimes people don't recognize the impact of the sly remarks of if you were, if you just tried a little harder. Or I can tell that you didn't try because if you had a tried, this is what it would look like for a successful student. So to sort of be martyred because I couldn't perform to some standard that just wasn't attainable in the ways in which they were asking for it. Um, I'd even had teachers who um, accused me of cheating because there was no way that I could have understood the content based on my intellectual ability when I don't have an intellectual challenge. I have a decoding a processing disorder. So them not understanding and their ignorance was embedded in how I understood myself. And I really had to work that out. And you also talked about the anxiety, right? Some of that as well. Um, and Mr. Rodriguez, why don't you tell us about how it affected you mentally? Um, I would say like the worst scars as a dyslexic and we would get together at the National Convention you know, people would talk in the lobby lounge. The worst scars that you get are first, second, and third grade. The trauma is, I still have it today. It never goes away. It just gets better. Those scars, like, of the part that is being labeled as not smart, that scar of, like, being less than because you're not able to learn in the way they're teaching. Um, and even because of those scars, I mean, I still deal with some of that stuff today and years later. Um, I didn't go back to college till later because when I, you know, I learned ice carving at 16, but I ended up a few years later on a cruise ship and I was in Hawaii, you know, sculpting ice, you know, seven day cruises. And then I was on a ship that went, an Italian ship that went around the world. And when I came back, I ended up teaching at a culinary school but you still have those scars from first, second, and third. They are deep and painful. And, you know, even now some of them comes back. So going back to school, I slowly went back to school. I decided to take one or two classes at it, you know, at a community college. And, you know, I say, I, you know, I hadn't been back to school since I dropped out. And when you go to community college, you take the placement test. You know, I tested so low that my classes didn't even have grades. So, uh, you know, you know, I say that to kids because it's not where you start, it's kind of where you're, you're going, what you want to, want to do. Uh, and so I slowly eased into it, and then I learned about how I learned, and then all of a sudden, like Dr. Anderson and other people here, you do well. And then from community college propelled me to Berkeley and to Harvard and other places like that. But yeah, I'm old, <laughs> and married and have two kids, and I still have those scars. And why I like to advocate is I don't want my kids or any other kids to have those scars. I want them identified at first grade. I learned different, great. These are the techniques that work for you. The sky's the limit, like Ms. Uh, Dr. Anderson's books say and things like that. So that's kind of, uh, I don't want kids, you know, kids to have those scars. And that is so important, so. Thanks for that. Um... Mr. Mendoza, t tell us about how all this impacted your mental health. Yeah, I think I could relate to Mr. Rodriguez. I think that uh, most of this for me was all scars that were never addressed at a, in our elementary. You know, like the feelings of feeling outcast, embarrassed, ashamed, uh, not worth it, uh, not capable of, all those things always came with me when I left elementary and I went to middle school, they were with me. Nobody knew, it was just all in my mind. And, oh, and then not talking about other factors, right? Other factors that happen in my life, not only the school situation, there's other things that are happening in my life that eventually 
that combination of, of, of it eventually lead, led to me behaving a certain way, acting up a certain way. Um, the reason why I joined a gang at the age of 14 is because I, I felt lonely, outcast, and I didn't feel worth it. And I wanted to be part of something bigger than myself. And I wanted some type of worthness, some type of respect, because in elementary, I didn't feel respected. In elementary, I didn't feel like I was worth it. I didn't feel like I was part of the class, of the group, or the field trips, or all those. So I felt like I needed to do something about those things. And I think that I found those in the negative influences. And that's why I joined a gang. That's not the main reason why. But I think that it affected my, my developmental way of thinking. It affected me just in general, uh, psychologically. And, and none of this, you, nobody saw this until I started acting up in middle school and in high school. And then I started getting arrested. And because none of that is being addressed in those moments as well, I, I'm 27 years of age. I've never been in therapy. You know, all the therapy that I got or counseling that I got while being incarcerated, it was never real therapy because it was part of people from the system that are doing those for you. So I never was honest to the counselors. I was never honest to the therapists because I didn't trust them, you know? And I feel like I've been able to cope with it now just because I tell my story all the time on panels and stuff like that. And I work with other people. So, you know, I think that I have that because I work at a nonprofit, I get to do those things. But in general, I would say it affected me a major because uh, like I said, it just made me feel outcast and lonely. Like I was incapable and that led me to do dumb things as a young kid that ended up me being criminalized and and you know it just kept getting worse over the years um and never got addressed so so yeah I think that it really had a big influence and big it was a big factor of of of, of me ending up in, in incarcerated at a young age and then um Miss Murray can you can you tell us about how it affected your son um a lot of the actions that were taken in kindergarten and first grade uh, were very traumatic. They were taken in response to behavioral issues that were you know, partially caused by his frustration with the learning. The things that happened in, in kindergarten and first grade, um, he's now in ninth grade. I can say he, they still affect him today. You know, it, the, Those scars are real and um, those early impacts are lifelong. So, you know, we're running out of time here, but I, I want to give you guys uh, the opportunity to first speak to the kids that may be watching this. Um, what can you tell them about, from your experience, you, what, what message do you want to give them? Speaking to, to them directly, Dr. Anderson, I'll start with you. Um, speaking to the kids or speaking to my seven-year-old self, um, different is okay. Like, it, it's okay to learn how you learn. It's okay to do what you want to do. Um, and you don't have to fit the box and you don't have to fit some mold. We do have to explore how you can be successful. So I, I think that they're, they're sort of like the, this two-tone of like, I might not fit in this box, but I need to figure out where I fit and sort of navigating that. And if I was sort of talking to myself as a younger me, just sort of holding on to that creativity. I'd um, talked to one of my colleagues earlier and he, he was saying something and like, I hadn't heard it put this way, but he's like, because of the way that your brain works, you know, I spent all this time overcompensating. Um, so because of the way that my brain works, most people are somewhere around steps one and two. But because I'm thinking ahead, like I'm concerned about that popcorn reading and skimming ahead to make sure I'm prepared so that I don't fumble over words, I'm already on steps 11 and 12 while everyone else is processing that first thing. So as we sort of think that some of these things for us as we were younger, they were curses, I sort of find that as I get older, like being dyslexia has actually been like a hidden talent because I think through things and I think about things in ways that other people don't. So if I was sort of talking to my younger self, so if I would talk about it, like I was learning how to master my superpower. And at first it was kind of sketchy and I couldn't figure it out. But then once I was able to like navigate and get a hold of it and master it, I was able to take over the world. Excellent. All right, Mr. Rodriguez. And I, I will send this out to like parents and, yeah. and to kids. I, I would say to them, it's going to be all right, you know. Uh, your kids and a lot of times it's half the adults you learn different but you've got like incredible talents 
you need to find like the thing that you're really good at that'll drive you forward and it'll create like momentum that you'll just go. And I would also say to them is encourage kids. And I know a lot of people are doing it now is there's a lot of dyslexic because I've been across the country and other places that run their own business. Too many dyslexics have their own business. So I would say, you know, I would argue you have a talent to run your own business. So I would say, don't, you know, my daughter is, you know, second grade and she's doing things that are business things. So I would say they need to start fifth, six, middle school and high school doing their own business, running things, learning how all that works, because that is, I believe, is their specific talent is running a business, whatever that is related to their interests, but they have skills that that work well. And I've seen that. So I would encourage moms and dads, you know, get the financial literacy for your kids, running their own business, lots of dyslexics everywhere and business for them. So, and that it's going to be all right. Your kid's going to be fantastic. And one thing I wanted to say is there used to be the, you know, the statements, you know, when parents, you know, they would get the diagnosis for their kids saying, oh, your kid, is uh, dyslexic. A lot of times there'd be crying and sadness, like the parent did something. No, you should celebrate the skills that your dyslexic kid or you know other type of things that they have. So that is my message. Yeah, but also at the same time, keeping in mind that for some students, that's you know that they need to have those mentors. They need to have that support so that they can actually tap into those um, strengths that they have. Mm -hmm. And Mr. Mendoza, can you tell us, well, speak to the kids, speak, speak to them, tell them what would you, what would you tell those kids who are struggling with reading, with, with accessing their education? What can you, what would you say to them? Um, obviously everything that the two gentlemen just said, I, I think that's good things, but I would just say that, um, that you're not alone. You're not alone in this journey, in this struggle. There's many people that are going through similar or probably more tougher situation than you are, but you're not alone and that we can overcome everything that is in front of us. As someone that went through probably some of the most gloomiest moments in my life, facing 25 to life, going through the system, almost being deported, you know, and now not having a record in my, my background, you know, I'm able, to, if I'm able to do it, anybody else can do it. Uh, and I think the other thing is that I do believe that we parents and educators, we need to ask our young, our young sons and daughters, what do you want? What are you good at? What do you want to learn more about? And ask those questions and start. If the kid tells you, I don't know, but I kind of like the piano, try to find a piano class for that kid. Maybe he wants to skate. Maybe he wants to write. We don't know until we ask them. Sometimes they're not going to tell us. It's just going to be hidden inside of them. Always wondering, oh, I wish I could do this, but they're never going to tell us. So sometimes we have to take the initiative to ask, what do you want? And invest in those things because I feel that that's what we need to be investing, whatever they want. If they want to be a producer, film producer, let's get them there. If we want to be a, a teacher, let's get them there. I feel like just asking them what they want instead of giving them what we think they need is what we need to be doing. And also just, uh, yeah, uh, we have the potential to do everything, anything and everything we want uh, in, this, uh, in this world. I mean, back in the days in the medieval times, you had young people, kings, they were as young as 14, 16. See, so they could do that back in those days, we could do bigger things in these times. Oh, thank you for that. That's excellent. Uh, Ms. Murray, quickly tell us, I want you to speak to the parents. Tell them, what, what do you want them to walk away from this conversation with? Uh, to the parents, I would say first, find other parents who have been there and get advice from them. Second, find out how to get the testing your child needs. Third, find out how to get the kind of instruction your child needs. And fourth, be ready to take this on. Don't rely on, on anybody else to do this for you, for your child. It's on you sometimes to take matters into your own hands. And then I have a message in case there are any educators in the, uh, in the audience. Um, the State, of Depart State Department of Education in California has put out an excellent California dyslexia guidelines. It's a handbook. You don't have to reinvent this from the start. Just you and your administrator should take a look at it 
and and see what you can do to bring this uh, this instruction to the children in your school. Excellent. And I, I think that's a good note to end on. I want to thank all of our panelists for sharing their stories and their experiences with us. Um, I urge everybody to connect with us on social media, to visit Decoding Dyslexia California's website. There are resources there for you, uh, for everyone. Um, thanks again for joining us. I hope that this discussion tonight will serve as a call to action. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and we cannot afford to turn away from the inequities that are occurring in our schools. Students should not be deprived of the opportunity to read. And uh, that kind of brings me to my next point, which is screening for the risk of dyslexia can help to create uh, equitable outcomes for all students. And that's why Decoding D Dyslexia California is co-sponsoring SB 237, which embraces a model of prevention, not a model of failure. And uh, you can help students by signing our petition in support of SB 237, which would require brief, low cost, universal screening for the risk of dyslexia in kindergarten through second grade. And the screening instruments are going to be culturally, linguistically, and developmentally appropriate for our students. So look for that link in the chat. It only takes a minute to sign this petition. And this can be one way that we can help our students in our schools. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks for our wonderful panelists. If you want to unmute and clap, or you want to just put that hand emoji up there, we would appreciate it and stay connected with us. Thank you. We are going to be having additional um, presentations in the future. Make sure you join our organization uh, or, or go to our website to get emails, get our email list so you can hear about the next things that we have in the works. We have a dyslexia simulation that's gonna be coming up next month. There's gonna be some additional converse conversations that are going to be had with our wonderful panelists. So you won't wanna miss it. We may not have gotten to all these questions. Please shoot us an email, uh, send me an email to, uh, so that I can get back to you guys and, and, and connect you with our wonderful panelists and, and answer those questions that you have. Use us as a resource. We all need to support each other because at the end of the day, our kids need to learn how to read. And this is critical. We're, we have a literacy crisis in California and we cannot, we can't turn away from this. We Absolutely. Need to Thank you so much, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you guys. Thank you. It was great to meet you virtually. <laughs> mm -hmm.